welcome to our review on electronic structure. So first thing we really need to understand is just the sheer amount of information that we can actually gain just by looking at a chemical formula. So in the middle there you can see we've got the chemical formula CuSO4 and if you have a look around the outside you can see all of the different things that we can actually work out just by looking at that one formula. So the first thing is that it contains three elements and we can identify them from their capital letters because every new symbol for an element starts with a capital letter, remember. They're made up of these three elements which happen to be copper, which is Cu, sulphur, which is S, and oxygen, which is the O. And if we count the number of atoms, which is a common question that they like to ask, then there are four oxygens, as we can tell from the little four at the bottom right there, one sulphur, one copper, so that gives us a total of six atoms altogether. Copper is a metal, our sulfur and oxygen are non-metals. Obviously they're all joined together through a chemical bond, hence the formula we've got there, which tells us it's a compound, and it's a compound called copper sulfate. So all of that information we can ascertain just by looking at that one formula. When we look at the periodic table then, we need to understand that it's arranged in certain ways. So if we look at our periodic table, then there are these vertical columns on there, which are called groups. And on the periodic table you get in your exam paper, which is found on the back page, then they have actually got the numbers at the top there. So group one has a number one at the top, group two a number two, and so forth. The other aspect we have is the horizontal rows. Now the horizontal rows on our periodic table are referred to as periods. And again, they just count up in numbers. So at the very top of your periodic table, you've got hydrogen and helium, which make up period one. Then our second period, which starts off with lithium and goes all the way across and so on. So what you can actually do is by using the coordinates of groups and periods, then you can work out what elements there are actually on the periodic table. And they do like to ask you that every so often to identify an element in period four or an element in group six, for example. So you need to obviously remember groups are the vertical columns, periods, the horizontal rows. Now, once we look at the periodic table, one of the things that we work out is the number of electrons present in each of those different elements. And we need to understand that the arrangement of these electrons is quite a specific pattern. What we have around the nucleus of our atom then are the electrons all arranged in these shells. And the different shells can hold different numbers of electrons. So what we actually have then, once we've put our electrons into these different shells, the arrangement of them is referred to as the electronic structure. In order to actually work out the electronic structures correctly, we've got to remember three rules. First rule is that the innermost shell, shell one, the one closest to the nucleus, can hold a maximum of two electrons. Shell two, the next one out, can hold a maximum of eight electrons, and the third shell can hold a maximum of eight electrons. So what we actually do when we're writing these electronic structures is we always start by filling up from the innermost shell, that shell one. So if we've only got one or two electrons, we will only have that first shell. If we've got obviously three to 10 electrons, then we'd have the first and second shell. And if we go above that, we'd have our third shell present as well. And the way we represent those electrons then is usually as a cross, but a dot will also be accepted on your exam as long as it's nice and clear. The key thing to remember here is if you're asked to draw the electronic structure, that you've got nice clear markings for your electrons. There's a maximum of two on the innermost shell, a maximum of eight on the second, and a maximum of eight on that third shell. The final thing you need to do when you're doing this is to just write down the number of electrons present in each shell. So at the bottom underneath that diagram there, you can see we've got the configuration for sodium, two, eight, one. So that's all you do is however many electrons there are in the first shell, put that number first, separate it by a comma or a dot, how many are in the second shell, comma or dot, and then how many are in the third shell. If you don't have any more than the first shell, you don't have to write anything other than say two. The last thing we need to know is how we actually reach these conclusions about this structure. We've already heard of this scientist called Rutherford who developed his theory 
all using the results from experiments that were carried out by two other scientists called Geiger and Marsden. And what they actually did in their experiments then was they had these positively charged particles that they fired at gold atoms. And what they did was they watched what happened to those positive particles. And what they actually found was that some of those particles were deflected instead of passing right through it. So that actually led to this idea of a nuclear atom because obviously there was something in there that was deflecting those particles that they were firing at the gold atoms.